Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us, Father. And we do owe you all things. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings in our lives. We also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. Also, Father, we pray for June, Jody, Joe, Steve, Joe, and Gary. On all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch and that you heal in Yahshua's precious holy name. And as always, Father, we, we, well, we pray for all those who are suffering, uh, living without you, and we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, that they have not forsaken thy word, and that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And we pray for Israel in our nation, for thy kingdom to come, for thy will to be done as it is in heaven to which we say, come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day that are on the front lines helping your children. And we pray for the military who are in arm's way or who are about to go into arm's way for their safety and speedy return. And we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity to receive thy truth. And we pray, dear Lord, that you open up our eyes today and we pray that you open up our ears, that we may hear thy words as it is written. And Father, we also pray and wish you a happy Father's Day, because you are all our fathers. As well as those fathers around the world today, Father, tomorrow we're going to be honoring Father's Day, and we pray for each and every one. Now, Father, again, I pray that you open up our eyes, that we may see our ears, that we may hear thy words as it is written as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're getting back into our Father's Word. Um, we're in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul basically, he's, he's been leading us through, yes, he's been this letter is to the Corinthians, but he's been leading us through talking about... Um, different aspects of where the church has gone astray, so to speak, or lost their their way, if you will. It's interesting because you, you would think that once people become Christian, as basically he's talking to the folks here as Christians, um, they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they and they were studying uh, what was given to them through Paul and Cephas and, and others, um, that they would get it. Well, we could even say that today. It, what, what keeps coming on in my mind, just came on TV the other day on the news, of all these... Um, uh, children's deaths. There's been like six, 700 children's death in automobiles from suffocation, you know, the heat. Um, I, I can't remember for how long it took 700, but they're coming out like, like I got this app, it's called Waze. It's, it's, you know what that is, right? Where it, it tells you, you push it and shows you the, the road conditions and traffic patterns and all that. Well, evidently, they come out with a new app on there. You're supposed to do something with it. I don't know how it works, but uh, it tells you and reminds you when you get to your location that you got a child in the car. And when we've been talking basically about people getting back in, you know, getting worldly and... Um, having the world overcome their thoughts and their actions, which causes them basically to sin. And this thing come up on TV the other day talking about the, the in, not necessarily infants, uh, the last one I think was a seven-year-old. He wasn't an infant, but still, he died in the car because his 
mother was inside the store uh, shoplifting. And when she got caught and arrested, she didn't even tell that the child was in the car with all the windows rolled up you know, until later. Um, now the latest thing they're saying, well, this, this car is coming out with this to let you know there's a child in the back and this car is coming out with something else. Now they're saying, what you need to do is take one shoe off and put it in the back seat so that when you get out of your car, you'll remember. Now, how, how sick is that? Is that you'll remember your shoe, but you won't remember your child. See, when I said and wished Happy Father's Day, I'm talking about fathers who are actually fathers, who care about the kids. You know, that's a father to me. Just someone who has sex and produces a child does not make a father. And um, a father will care for his kids. And uh, by all means, everyone makes mistakes. I've made mistakes in my life. But uh, I've always seemed to try to do what's right as a father. And um, that's what... Uh, that's what fathers should do. They should take care of their kids. So with that being said, we're dealing with Paul now, or basically I should say Paul's dealing, or our father's dealing through Paul with these folks in first in, in, in Corinth. And now we're going to be talking about knowledge today. And again, you would think that a person who has knowledge doesn't make mistakes. But that's not the case, as we're going to see here in just a moment. So with that being said, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, Now, now he's changing the subject here from last week. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up or makes proud, but charity edifieth or love builds up. Now what do you think he's talking about here? First first off, it's two different things. He's saying, you know, touching things offered unto idols. What he's talking about here is, is um, I guess, a couple different things avenues on this. Back in the day there were some people that would um, sacrifice animals to their idols. And um, what Paul is going to be talking about here says we have knowledge about this thing. We have understanding that there's only one God. And that for someone to sacrifice to a stick god or a stone god or whatever, we have knowledge that that means nothing to us. You know, because it's a false god. But it also says here, knowledge puffeth up. Now what do you think he means, knowledge puffeth up? Anybody? Anybody out there? When people themselves as wise in their own eyes, they sometimes get vain and proud. Well, yes, but when they say, when you said knowledge in their own eyes, what we're basically dealing with here is knowledge of what our Father wants or doesn't want, of what we should deal with or not deal with. So the knowledge he's talking about here is, is true, real knowledge of God and how He wants things done. But by having that kind of knowledge, why would that puff us, puff us up? Because like what you're saying is that it, it's like flyaway doctrine. We have the knowledge of that flyaway doctrine according to Ezekiel 13.20 God is against those who teach his children to fly to save their soul. That's God's word, not ours. 
So with that knowledge, we know not to fall into the trap of today's teachings about flyaway doctrine. However, that does not mean with that knowledge we are to go into any church USA or wherever and they're teaching flyaway doctrine and call them all stupid or call them all ignorant. You know, that's not, that's basically like the way God looks at it, that's puffing ourselves up. That's not edifying. In other words, we're not building them up by tearing them down. So what Paul's going to be teaching us here, or our Father teaching us through Paul, how to deal with people. How to deal with people even though they are less understanding of our Father's Word. And that we need to deal with them right, rightly. So, he continues in verse 2. And if any man, now this would be any person of the world and worldly thinking, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. And he's basically talking about people who are puffing themselves up. And they're thinking that, that their knowledge and what they have is superior than everybody else. Now I've said this many times in our, in our chapel that uh, with the knowledge that Father has gifted us with in his word, we have to be careful in talking with people. That especially people who are, are not yet versed or on a neat level of understanding that they just don't understand some of the things and, and then again some people just think of what we say are just nuts to begin with you know they just don't believe it some people don't even believe in the Bible well, how can you teach someone about the Bible if they don't even believe in the Bible well it's an impossibility only a father can teach them at that point but he says but in verse 3 if any man love God now that's the condition the same is known of him. In other words, the same is recognized of him. If you truly love our Father, then people should see Father in you. How, how, how would people see Father in us? By what we say? By our reactions towards one another? Towards people? Um... It doesn't mean that we can't um, ever get upset about something. I get upset when when um, what's the word um, persecuted. I'm not supposed to because I know I have the knowledge that the more you have God within you, the more you're going to be persecuted. But with that knowledge, when I am persecuted unjustly I get upset and I shouldn't I think you do the same thing don't you you know and and afterwards I have to ask well of course I repent and I don't stay upset anymore like I used to I definitely don't seek revenge you know but um I still falter in that area. And that's, I guess everybody has a push button. Well, that's one of my push buttons. But here's the problem with that. Satan knows that push button as well. And, he, and he'll use it whenever he can. So I'm in a learning process of how to deal with this. So guess what happens? I get persecuted. Why? Because I have to learn how to overcome it. I can't go into the kingdom with anger on my heart. You know. And quite frankly, I was just persecuted not too long ago. But I don't have anger in my heart. As a matter of fact, one of the people we prayed for today was the one that what caused all this. You know? But God takes care of his own. I know this. That person we prayed for, was, yesterday was his last day. Yeah. 
and God takes care of his own. He takes care of the problems. So we need to know and understand that. So if any man love God, people should recognize that. And even if we do get angry, we should turn around out, uh, on the same subject matter. Uh, a person I got angry with the other day, I went and apologized for getting angry. Not what I said, but for saying it with anger, you know, which wasn't right. So I, I believe um, that's the way a Christian should behave. And that's what Paul's trying to teach us here. Verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there is none other God but one. We know this. We understand it. Some pe Do people today sacrifice? Well, there's all kinds of sacrifices today that people believe in. Yeah. But, verse 5 says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, there was many gods back in those days, what people called gods, and lords many. But, verse 6, to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Basically meaning you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So we know, we, we understand that all this stuff that people sacrifice to, now do people sacrifice today? In different ways. How do they sacrifice today? As far as uh, what we, not necessarily sacrificing animals, but how would people sacrifice to another God today? Or, or, uh, another entity today. Any ideas? How they sacrifice to another Time. entity? Huh? Time. Time. Time can be their God. Okay. You know, um, what they spend their time on, you know. It could be work. Yeah. It could be someone else. It could be self, you know. Mm-hmm. It was interesting, I, I was listening to this guy the other day talk, and he was talking about, um, I don't know what the subject was, but what, what strikes me is of where your heart is with our Father is open up a person's checkbook and look, look at their registry of where they put all their monies in. What's in... Now, you're doing what I, I did at first. I thought, well, that's stupid. You know, I buy food, I pay rent, you know, mortgage or whatever. No, he was going beyond that is where all that extra funds go if you have them. Some people don't even have that. You know, like going boats. Into savings or, or is it going into tithing or is it going into giving away? Boats or motorcycles or trips to Tahiti or, you know. And it kind of made sense in a way. Uh, of course, he was he was going on and on and on about tithing, you know, but um, it kind of uh, evoked a, a thought process in me of of people do. The bottom line is, people say that that, that they don't do this, but I believe they do. People do what they want to do, mm -hmm. you know. I remember a long time ago, not necessarily today. But a long time ago, I'd, I'd work, you know, Monday through Friday, I mean, I'd work like a dog. I'd work hard, and I'd be tired. Friday come around, I'm tired. But I had a boat, you know, a little 12-foot aluminum boat. I don't know if you remember that. And, um, and man, come Friday when I got off, you know, you think, oh, I'm just going to relax. I'd get in the car, hook up the boat, and phew, Take off like with Paul or, or, or uh, uh, I won't say the na last names, but uh, a couple of Pauls. And um, I'd drive for hours sometimes. You'd say, well, wait a minute now. Just 
just an hour or two ago, you were dead tired. But when it came to going out, taking that boat out and going fishing, it's like I got rejuvenated, you know. And I thought that was my rejuvenation back then. I didn't realize that I have more rejuvenation with my father than I ever had in the old days. I mean, I'm a whole lot older now. I'm a whole lot in my body weaker now. I can't do a lot of things. But, no matter how tired I am, if I am, when I get up on a Sabbath morning, when I open up the Word and I start teaching from the Word or studying it, I, re I get rejuvenated. You know, it's just like the old days of when I went fishing. And I can really relate to when, he says, when Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, I can really relate to that now, is that when... when I'm sure you were tired the other day at work, but when someone brings up a conversation to you about the Lord, do you not feel rejuvenated at that? You may not even realize it at the moment, you know, but it's, it's, it's the power of the Lord, and you're utilizing that power, is that you can rejuvenate yourself by that power of the Word. And to forsake that, to me, is just forsaking all the power that, that there is, in my opinion. But here he's talking about having that power, really, of knowledge that a lot of people today, let's bring it to today, a lot of people of today have this thinking about how certain things should be. And that if it's not that way, they get upset and they get cranky and they get worried, they get frustrated, whatever. But with the knowledge of God, you can see through all that stuff. And it's not important to you anymore. It's not that Father doesn't know that we need clothing and food on the table and a, a roof over our heads and, and our children to be taken care of and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and so it goes. He knows all this. But the point is, what's important to us is not the same as what's important to the world. And when you're walking in the world and, and allowing the world to be your director, that's where all this frustration is coming from. I mean, I laugh every day when I turn on the news. I mean, when I, when I hear all these politicians and these commentators and this and that and the other thinking of certain things are just so important so important and it's not it's it's all going to vanish every single bit of it and when i look at it and and understand it from our father's perspective i can't help but chuckle but some people man they're digging holes in the ground and storing up cans and cans of food and this and that and the other and it's amazing to me how people will allow the world to dictate their actions and they're never going to be happy, ever, until they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, to us there is one God, verse 6, the Father of whom are all things. And we did 6, didn't we? Verse 7. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol... Unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. He's, Paul's talking about people basically putting stock in the things of what man has created. And they're, they're putting their stock in uh, certain ways to eat, certain ways to prepare, certain ways to do these things. Remember when Jesus was here walking with his disciples, and uh, I don't know if it was the Pharisee or Sadducee at the time. They were out in the field, and they were. It was on the Sabbath day, and, and the uh, apostles were grabbing the the wheat from the shaft and rubbing it in their hands and eating a little bit of it. They, you know, according to man's law back then, they weren't supposed to do that. They weren't even supposed to be walking any great distance on the Sabbath day. And that's when Christ says, you know, what are you going to do if you're 
ox falls in a ditch, you're going to leave him there on the Sabbath? You know. In other words, you still can do certain things on the Sabbath. And here lies the problem with this, this idle situation, eating, drinking, whatever the case may be. There, you've got one group of people who says, well, you, you need to do it this way. And if you don't do it this way, you're going to be condemned. Um, now, let's not forget, these are people that are supposed to be Christian in Corinth. And they're still doing sacrifices and stuff. So that tells you, even though they have, they're supposed to have knowledge, they're not utilizing that knowledge. Okay. Verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither, if we eat, are we the better, neither, if we eat not, are we the worst. In other words, it doesn't matter to us about this, this idle stuff. Because it's all fake. It's phony. It's not real. Now, why, why do you think Paul's harping on this? Well, Again, just like what you said a little bit ago, if we bring it to today's standards, no, there's not people on every corner sacrificing animals. But there's people sacrificing, like what you said, of their time. You know, of, of, of all kinds of different things. Again, what? give me a definition of an idol. Anything you put before God. Anything or anyone you put before God can be an idol. So, does that mean just on Sabbath day? No, that's every day. You know, tell me what day do the commandments cease to exist? You know, it's every day of our lives. Um, I was talking to a person the other day that was concerned about uh, displeasing our father because they weren't in church every week. And I reiterated to them about us being the temple of God according to the word. And that you don't have to be in a church building to please God. You please God by doing for the least of these, as he told us. Helping people, being there for others. Now some people get to the point to where they're sick. And they just can't do what they used to be able to do. But why in the world would our Father forsake them at that time? Our Father doesn't forsake His children. His children forsake Him. Now, our Father has said, um, Our Father has said that if, if you forsake me, I will forsake you. In other words, if you, if you want to get rid of me in your life, fine. I'll allow that to happen. You know, if you don't want to be a part of, of of me and, and, and my teachings and my life, and you don't want to participate in the eternal kingdom, you have the free will choice not to. You don't have to. He's not going to force us. However, he says, look, if, if you love me, if you if you truly love me, what, what's the word saying? Was it First John? Uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me. See, a lot of people say that they love the Lord, but they don't want to obey his word. They don't want to keep his commandments. Or they want to pick and choose. What does our Father say about picking and choosing? It's all or nothing. You can't pick and choose what you want to believe or not believe. He wants you to... That's why he gave us holy scriptures. He wants us to believe and trust all of it. That's why he gave it to us. 
I've said this many times, this would be a very short book or books if all we had to do was say and believe in Christ Jesus. Accept Him as our Lord and Savior. John 3.16. This would be a very short book. Why, is, why are there 66 books? It's because there's a lot of things that we need to learn on how to be a proper Christian. And how to be a proper Christian is the proper way of dealing with each and every individual that comes across our path. Including our enemies. Including those persecuting us. And this day and age, there's more and more and more and more persecution than anything else. There's people that are backstabbing people left and right these days. Every day. Throughout the day. And we have to deal with that correctly. If we don't, we're going to fall short. We need to have the right attitude. Now, he never said that we had to be a walking mat, did he? That we just, you know, sit there and... You know, a lot of people use the uh, 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 reference of turning the cheek, you know. But what that is in reference to is that if you offend somebody like this here, like an idol worshiper, if you offend them and offend their beliefs and they turn around and slap you, what you're supposed to do is turn the other cheek. Why? Because you're supposed to know better not to go to that extreme. To not go to the point where you're offending a person's beliefs, even if it's wrong. You know, even if it's a wrong belief, we're not to offend them. Why? Because how can you win somebody over by offending them? I didn't say agree with them. You know, our Father is not saying agree with those idol worshippers. He's basically saying don't offend them. So, he elaborates more here. He goes, verse 9, But take heed, or take care, least by any means this liberty or this power that you have, this knowledge that you have of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. That's what he's talking about here. You have the knowledge. You have the understanding of certain things from our Father's Word. And you got a person over here who does not believe that. They don't trust in that. They, they have their own way of thinking, their own way of doing things. Father's saying, all right, don't be a stumbling block to them. Don't go to them saying, well, you're ignorant of the word, you're ignorant of the truth, you're ignorant of or whatever. Don't, don't deal with a person like that. Love them. It, that's why he used the word charity just a little while ago. Love them and accept in your heart that you know the truth but let go and let God at that point. It doesn't make sense that you both have different ideas of what the truth is cause a stumbling block to start with? Or can cause, better said? Well, Paul's going a little bit deeper than that. Paul is saying, look, one side has the knowledge. One side has the truth, not both. Mm -hmm. See, there. So to say, well, I'm okay, you're okay, kind of thing. It, it, you can't really go to that depth. Well, Paul is saying, look, you have the knowledge, you have the understanding of this particular thing, which the subject is idols, mm -hmm. or, or or eating of meat mm -hmm. given to idols, or brought forth from idols, in their opinion. You can acknowledge that they believe this, but you don't go to the point of saying, well, what, what you're doing is okay by God, but you don't say those words. Isn't there a part in there where if you're sitting down to table with a person that is, is eating of meat sacrifice, it's okay for you to eat it because you know it wasn't sacrificed? Of course. That's what Paul is going here mm -hmm. with, is that... You can, you know, it, it's it's all right. It's like the example of you got a big old piece of uh, ribeye, juicy old ribeye, right in front of you. You go to somebody's house, and they put a big old, big old piece of juicy ribeye there in the center of the table, and everybody else around has uh, 
I don't know, a bowl of peas or something. <laughs> and they say, you can't eat that ribeye because that ribeye, we reserve it to such and such angelic being or such and such aisle or whatever the case may be. Now to you, that's a big old juicy piece of ribeye, fresh off the grill. Now to you, you could dig in that without any problem whatsoever and not think twice about it. But you would offend them, you know. And what Father is saying, what he wants us to do is even though in life, when we're going through life and we deal with all kinds of different people's religions and beliefs and thoughts, and if this is what they believe, we're not to just tear, run into them and tear them down. Now, if they ask us questions about certain things, we can tell them what we believe. Um, I guess a, a good example of this is what I did before I learned this. We were uh, eating over somebody's house one day. We were invited over for dinner. And right before we, we, we started to eat, a person in, in that group asked us about the Bible code. Because they were reading this book, this is back a few years, about the Bible code and that how they believed it, it, it was a deeper understanding of the Bible and it was coding the Bible and all this and that and the other how great it was to them and they asked me point blank what do you think of this Bible code to which I didn't hesitate saying well it's really good for that fireplace over there now, it's a true statement because it was false. It's not even doctrine. You know, it's, it's a fake religion trying to establish something that's fake. But I offended them. And from that point on, they never came back to the ministry. Now, this is exactly what our Father is trying to get through to us is that what is best? Now, I'm not saying allow people to live in ignorance. He's not saying that here. But what he is saying is that a person will ask a question, but when you give an answer, you need to be kind and charitable, meaning loving. And look at their level where they're at and deal with it. Don't throw the whole book out. I was going to say the level because... They may not be on the same level of understanding at that point in time. That doesn't mean they're not going to attain it later on down the road if there's not a stumbling block put in their way. They're trying. And by you putting up a stumbling block, it's going to push them away, not bring them to the ministry. Mm -hmm. you know. But again, that doesn't mean that we don't allow people to, to speak their minds and stuff. But where do you draw the line? Let's say you're let's say you're in a church setting instead of just out in the in the world in ministry work. Let's say you're in a church setting. People, the way I look at it, people who believe in like idols or flyaway doctrine and that sort of thing. Let's just say flyaway doctrine. They wouldn't last a day in this church. No, not unless they, they would. Know, Why? Not unless they they fully understand and and use. We can agree to disagree. And that's the only way they could they could even stay. Yes, but I think eventually they wouldn't stay because we we teach on many occasions that that flyaway doctrine is false doctrine. A a person who believes in Easter Easter would not last very long in this congregation. Because we teach what our Father says in His Word about Ishtar. You know, or sunrise service. What our Father teaches about it. You know, so they're not going to stay. We don't need to push them out. All we have to do is read the Word. Study the Word. Bring the Word forward. The Word will push them away. To another location. Why do you think you have so many different churches? With the same... Now, I'm talking about... I'm not 
talking about all Hindus and this and that. I'm talking about why there are so many different churches reading this same Bible. Christian churches. Why are there so many different ones? Because they interpret it differently. It's as simple as that. So who's right and who's wrong? God's right. The world is wrong. And it comes down to that. So, verse 9 again. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Verse 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? How, what does that say to you? You didn't hear that, did you? No. Uh, let me read it again. Verse 10. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Hmm. So, in other words, you have your knowledge, but you're also influencing somebody else to possibly go down the wrong path by because you think it's okay to eat or you believe it's okay to eat that what's what's offered to idols. They're weak in their faith or their knowledge. It could steer them down the wrong path. Speeding by example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and in other words, basically is that again, you got you got a weak person, you got a strong person. You got one that has knowledge and understanding of our Father's Word about idols, eating, drinking, whatever the case may be, and you got one that doesn't have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. You definitely need to understand that. And just because you don't, just because you have this knowledge, does not mean that you need to lay superiority over right. that person. Because a lot of times we assume everybody's on the same level. Well, and that's where we really run mm -hmm. into mistakes. Mm -hmm. I used to think that way in this congregation, that we were all on the same level. And I got very disappointed many times over the years. Because just because it's being taught, and we go through it, and every people are nodding their heads and saying, you know, they agree in this and that and the other, doesn't mean that they grasp it all. Mm -hmm. And just because I taught it doesn't mean at times I grasp it all. You say, well, how can you teach it then? I don't teach it. Father teaches it. He just uses my mouth. You know, where and we all come up to a certain level of understanding of what we're willing to accept. Believe it or not, a lot of people will not accept everything that's being taught. I hate to say that, but it's true. That's why you have difference of opinions. Does that make me greater and them lesser? Absolutely not. This is what Father's trying to say. Look, they don't understand this. You understand it. Okay. No one understands it. They don't understand it. And, and be okay with that. They may not be ready to receive that knowledge. It's just, again, it's just like building a house. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't build a roof before you have a foundation. You know, and that foundation has, has got to exist and has to be strong before you can build a proper house on it. I mean, how many times you see these places around the world that have these earthquakes or these hurricanes and just everything's just devastated down to the ground? Or those hurricanes hitting on some of the uh, beaches well, some of those houses look they, like they weren't even touched. And you go, what, did it just scoot over here and went jump over? No. That one house is built out of complete cement. Roof and everything. Solid. Ain't nothing going to bring it down. You know, you could even flood through it. Yeah, they'll lose their innards, you know, their furniture and stuff. But the structure's still going to be there. Why? Because of the way it was built. 
Well, this is what our Father's trying to do in our lives. He's trying to build that strong foundation and that we can deal with anyone or anybody in any church system or any theology and that we don't put them down. You know, we acknowledge it for what it is and where it's coming from. We have that knowledge from our Father. That's what he's saying here. Verse 11, And through thy knowledge, through thy understanding shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Question. In other words, if that person is weak in knowledge, does that mean he's going to perish? Hmm. Why? Not if he has belief in Christ. Ah, see, Christ was the equation here. He believed in Jesus Christ. You say, well, wait a minute now. Jesus says, he who does not obey me is perished? Is that what he says? Mm. No. He says basically is that he who loves me will obey me, obey my commandments mm -hmm. and follow them. So, so you can go through life accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, but still be weak. Why? Why would a person that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ still have an opportunity of being weak in life. Because they don't have the foundation, which is in the Bible, how to deal with the world and self and others. So in other words, they're basically putting their entire stock on John 3.16 mm -hmm. and not the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some people believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and don't ever even go to the Old Testament. Why? Because they've been taught, they believe by false doctrine that since Jesus Christ died on the cross that he did away with the Old Testament. That's what they're told. And that's what they believe. Now, if a person will follow false doctrine, they're weak in faith. That's why you're having more and more and more people leave those theology churches and start studying on their own. Who's leading them to do that? Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit of our Father is leading them to do that. If they cannot be taught properly in some of these churches, which, quite frankly, in some of these churches, they shouldn't even have their doors open because they're bringing forth false religion, false doctrine, false teaching. Why in the world would you want to be a part of that? I mean, how many people have you come across in this world today it says, look, you know, I've, I used to go to church. I used to do this. I used to do that. But I'm finding out that I can't get my questions answered. You ran into that the other day. I can't get, why can't you get your questions answered? You know, they don't you, have the answer. <laughs> evidently. Yes, but they kind of cock and bull their way through it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about those false preachers. Mm -hmm. Because they don't know it. You know, now, am I saying that a preacher should have all knowledge? No, only God has all knowledge. But you should have the tools to be able to find the answer. Mm -hmm. you know, Father says in his word, I have foretold you all things. That means if you have a question about him, his kingdom, or how to get there, how to behave as a Christian in this world today, he's given you all the answers that you need. How to have peace. Well, that will bring you peace. Yes. Knowledge brings peace. God knowledge. You know, there's plenty of knowledge of the world mm -hmm. in people's lives today. That doesn't bring them peace. Yes. We're talking about godly knowledge. Verse 12. But when ye sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Now, does that make perfect sense from everything that he taught us? In other words, you know better. You know better. And you purposely put them down or, or, or um, wound their, their, their hearts. Like what I said to that, that person years ago. You know, you ought to throw that thing in the fireplace. I wounded them. Now, 
Did I purposely wound them? Not in my heart. I thought I was being honest. I was being honest, but I still wounded them. Father consider, considers that with you having the knowledge now of what he's talking about here, a sin. A something you need to repent for. You know, or you will not enter the kingdom of God. That's how serious he looks, because sin cannot enter the kingdom of God. He says sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, if you know better, and you purposely wound that person in what you say to them, and what their beliefs are, you're sinning. Now, they're still a sinner. They're still weak. They're still not accepting the fullness of what you're giving them. But what you're giving them hurts them. All right, what's a perfect example of that? A person who believes in the East Star. And we say, look, Ishtar is a pagan holiday. Now they believe that they're worshiping Christ. But you said no. It's a pagan holiday. You're supposed to be honoring Passover. It's never changed. We have that knowledge. But you just offended them. That means to our Father, if you do this on purpose, you're sinning. You say, well, how can, be, how can giving the truth be a sin? Because you're wounding them. Now, you can approach it a different way. Could you not? If a person, you got a person sitting across from you that believes in Easter. <coughs> get on the subject. You could say, well, what I do, see, what, what my family does, we do the Passover. We used to do Easter. But we don't do that anymore. That's opening up a door, is it not? Is that condemning them? It's not condemning them. It's just saying, well, we used to do Easter, but, but now we do Passover. Now, at that point, that will open up a door for a question. Well, if you used to do Easter and you do Passover, now, what changed? Ah, question. See, you're not wounding them then. If they get wounded with kindness, you're not sinning. See, if you're if you're if you're not condoning and condemning someone for their beliefs, that's not sinning. Teaching the truth is not sinning. See, see how he wants us to work it. No, he wants us to be gentle with people and not condoning them for their beliefs. Condemning them. Condemning them. Even, even if they're, they're following false doctrine. But we can approach it differently. Remember, uh, was it John or Paul? Paul, I guess, going out and uh, eating and drinking with the Gentiles. And um, the other apostles come up to him and says, what are you doing? Yeah, did him and Peter get into an argument over that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big argument. Uh, a lot of this at that point was about circumcision. You know, where the Christian church, which was the other apostles, wanted everyone to be circumcised. Oh, okay, you can, you can eat with the Gentiles, but they all got to be circumcised. And Paul says, uh-uh. No, they don't. They don't have to be circumcised at all. Because Paul knew he had the knowledge from Christ that circumcision was of the heart, not physical circumcision, as of the old law. He said, well, wait a minute now. The apostles, man, they were with Christ and, and all that. They, they should have known. Well, they didn't know this. Even though Christ had said. I mean, why? why Do you ever ask yourself, why did Christ go to Paul on the road to Damascus and not go to one of the apostles and say, well, I want you to go to the Gentiles? They were already apostles. Why not go to them? Because of knowledge. Paul had other kinds of knowledge that our father knew that he needed to talk in other languages and other areas of the world that the 
that the Galileans just didn't possess. So he utilized Paul in this. So, don't wound a weak person. And finally in verse 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. In other words, hey, look, you know, if, if, if not eating this meat will offend them, if eating this meat will offend them, as long as I'm standing, I won't do it. I, I won't offend my brother. And this is what our Father wants us to, to, to instill in our hearts, not just about idols, about everything, that when dealing with people in the world or even people in a church system, our Father does not want us to purposely go out and offend people with the knowledge that you possess. However, He does want us to teach the gospel, to spread the good news, you know, when given an opportunity, when asked a question. But approach all this stuff that people have weaker understandings of with kid gloves. And just don't come out with both barrels blazing. Do it with kid gloves. Does that make sense? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that, what will that do for us, really? That will, number one, keep us from the street corners with bullhorns saying they're all going to hell. Remember that guy used to do that all the time on Patton Avenue? I think it was every Friday night. In town, too. In town, too. Yeah. I remember a guy at Bell Share standing on a soapbox. He literally, I mean, he had <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of people around him. And he's saying, you're all going to hell. Boy, that opened up a can of worms. You know. Um, but she can't, you know, that, that's crazy talk. So, we need to understand that our Father wants us to deal with the world with kid gloves. Alright, any questions? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the knowledge that you bring forward. And Father, we are still learning. We still have things that we must understand. However, we have been given a great gift of understanding. Many, many things. And we, I pray that we will go forth and utilize what you have given us with love and compassion instead of being dogmatic in what we do. And we owe it all to you for your teachings. I pray for everyone here today and all our families and all those on YouTube that you watch over us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. And forevermore, we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious name we pray. Amen. To God be the glory.